<clears throat> Hello. So uh, today we'll talk about uh, two architects. Well, the first one is an engineer, was an engineer, but an exceptional engineer, uh, one of the best. And he was thus also an architect because he had aesthetical concerns and uh, of the highest order. Eduardo Toroja. And then we'll talk about a Frenchman, an architect, <clears throat> André Lursa, both born on the same day. Uh, not the same year, but on this day uh, of, uh, of August. So I begin with Eduardo Toroja, uh, born in 1899, uh, on the 27th of August, and he died in June in 1961. He was a Spanish structural engineer and a pioneer in the design of concrete shell structures. Uh, this was the man. Uh, and you can tell from this picture that he was totally absorbed by his work. And thus, I would say he was a poet of uh, architecture and a poet of, of, of uh, engineering. And I think we need more people like him, you know, who dedicate their lives to, uh, you know, the path they chose in life. In a way, dreamers. He was a dreamer, but also a doer because he built. So uh, Eduardo Toroja is uh, in, uh, held in very high esteem by both engineers and, uh, and architects. Concrete shell architecture, a definition. What is a concrete shell um, uh, architecture? A concrete shell, also called thin shell, concrete structure, is composed of a thin shell of concrete formed in such a way as to be self-supporting often with no interior columns or exterior buttresses. The shells are most commonly flat plates and domes. They can also take the form of ellipsoids or cylindrical sections. The first concrete shell dates back to the second century. So uh, it, it, it wasn't quite uh, a, new, um, a new invention. These concrete shapes are usually strong structures allowing clear spans without the use of internal supports, giving an open, unobstructed interior. The use of concrete as both the form and structure can reduce both material cost and construction cost over other approaches to design and construction, as concrete is relatively inexpensive and plastic to conform to compound curves. The resulting structure may be immensely strong and safe. Well, but the problem is that concrete uh, pollutes. Now, we, we start with this aqueduct, uh, quite elegant. Uh, I almost said beautiful. You know, it's, it's, it's what structure at its best does. You know, it becomes aesthetical. It becomes beautiful. And, uh, and uh, it takes a good engineer, but also a sensitive engineer to do something like this. It's very simple, but it's elegant. And uh, although it's a utilitarian structure, uh, you cannot deny its uh, artistic or aesthetical, uh, aesthetical virtues. Sometimes we can learn from engineers to be poets again, or you know, to be poets. I don't know if you know, but <clears throat> Le Corbusier said that I love painters and I love engineers, but I don't love architects. He loved engineers and painters. And I asked myself, why? Well, maybe because uh, engineers and painters are somehow uh, not, you know, uh, they, 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 are, they are in a way more pure because they are dedicated clearly to one activity that is, uh, you know, clear cut, so to speak. While the architect almost by definition is impure in the sense that uh, he, the architect has to negotiate between various fields. Sometimes he's very prone to compromise the architect and uh, very uh, you know, uh, collaborative with the, with the powers, uh, financial or political. So I kind of understand why uh, Le Corbusier, who obviously was an architect, said what he said. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright put it in an amusing way when he said nothing wrong with architecture except the architects. Anyway, 
But we are talking now about an engineer who was an architect, actually. Uh, because of the, the aesthetical significance of, of, of what he built. A hippodrome, a, hippo, a hippodrome uh, architectural project. Uh, there were some architects here, and Toroja was the grandstand roof uh, designer. It was rehabilitated in 2014. Uh, conceived during the tumultuous years preceding the Spanish Civil War, the Zarzuela Hippodrome came about through a public contest sponsored by Madrid's Office of Suburban Access, who hoped that the winning design would replace the dilapidated Hippodrome or Hippodrome located in Paseo, Paseo de la Castellana. In uh, order to um, have difficulties to read because of, in order to expand the Castellania Ricoletos, one of Madrid's main uh, thoroughfares and the cornerstone of its growth in the 1930s, it became imperative to demolish the old uh, structure. Uh, anyway, for the new hypodrome, the planners sought out a more remote and suitable location, eventually deciding on a 115 hectare plot of land close to Monte El Pardo. Anyway, these are a lot of details where it would have been necessary space, but also be connected to the city center. Um, yeah, I usually don't like to read um, uh, so much text, but um, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, a focal point of the, for the designers was the relationship between the spectators and the horses, that they should always have visual contact to promote betting the end all be all of the race, but not interfere in each other's spaces. The proposed design was a metallic structure that meshed well with the topography of the land. It was situated on a mixed modern abstraction with the forefront trends of the time. So this is a test that uh, Toroja did, and it's quite uh, splendid, I would say. You know, it's, you, you look at this very audacious, audacious structure being uh, loaded with uh, incredible uh, weight and still, uh, you know, standing its, uh, its feet, so to speak. Uh, and, and now you see in the building, the, the beautiful canopies that, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are very thin and very elegant. And uh, yes, he was an architect. Uh, I mean, he worked with architects, but uh, I'm sure the, the most uh, uh, enticing part of this project was uh, what he did with this uh, very elegant and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, aspiring towards the infinite roof. If the if the if the horses uh, would have uh, uh, would have seen it with the eyes of uh, someone sensitive to to the beauty the architectural beauty of the roof probably they would have been been encouraged to run even quicker and uh, to to uh, go beyond their own limits so to speak. But it's not just the roof. Even here, you know, you see. Uh, an elegant, uh, elegant uh, disposition of, uh, of of the walls and and uh, the domed um, uh, part of the of the of the covering uh, uh, structure. It, it's elegant. It's simple, but it's elegant. And I'm sure the engineer had a lot to say here. So Eduardo Toroja in Spain. Um, we need engineers like him you know, uh, to collaborate with architects in creative terms, but also when they do work, because you will also see works done by, just by himself without, uh, uh, you know, without architects. Look how thin these concrete shells are. Uh, it, it, it's amazing. 
and they are self-supporting. You know, I mean, they are, you know, uh, I mean, not really self-supporting. I mean, they are self-supporting to an extent, but they still have, you know, legs like here, but very, very minimal. I wonder if these people know that, you know, they are in a building where uh, uh, an exceptional engineer uh, worked for. Anyway. But it's an organic hole. It's not just the roofing itself. It's you know the supporting structure, the balconies, the passageways. Everything is uh, has uh, the same uh, uh, the same aesthetics and, and the same purity. Although the roofing is the most spectacular one feature of, of, of this project. It's quite elegant and it's really uh, floating, flying. It's, 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 in a way, it's amazing. You, know? <laughs> you just support it here. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. Eduardo Toroja. Now a club in Venezuela, in Caracas, uh, this also uh, remarkable in, in similar ways to the work we saw in, uh, in, um, in Spain. Perhaps all architects and all uh, good engineers have the same dream to take off to fight against gravity. Uh, and they do it in different ways. Um, architects today do the same. They seem to want to take off, some of, some of them at least. There are even architects who, who claim that the future of architecture will be non-gravitational. But uh, on the other hand, I, I, I feel that actually the force of gravity is the only certitude we have. And perhaps architecture justifies uh, its um, uh, raison d'etre, its uh, reason to be uh, in, in contrast uh, to, to the force of gravity. And if you don't have the force of gravity, maybe it's more difficult to find the uh, legitimacy in, in, your, uh, in, in, in your work. Uh, so, um, the Gothic cathedral was, was, was erected, uh, growing towards the sky with stones, and it was def de defying gravity. But in the absence of gravity, I'm not sure. I mean, things would, would be easier in a way, but on the other hand, uh, um, meaningless. So this, this effort of the human beings to take off to fly, to the desire to, 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 to fly is probably based on the, on the very existence of the force of gravity. So I guess what I wanted to say, the premise of flight is exactly what is opposed to it, and that is gravity, the force of gravity. But look at this uh, shell. You know, it is amazing.
Eduardo Toroja in Caracas, uh, Venezuela. It, it was elegant even during the construction process, as you can see. Now, this does not belong to him or to them, uh, I think. It's, it's, it's just this. Uh, maybe this was built later, I don't know. Now, if this was his sketch, as I imagine it was, it shows uh, temperamental uh, artistic uh, uh, aptitude. Eduardo Toroja, shell concrete. It's logical, it's also uh, fluid, it's thin, it's economical, it's cultural, it has qualities. The only problem is that concrete, as you know, uh, does provoke pollution. And uh, in today's world, this matters. The bus, bus, a bus station, and look at this, you know, it's incredible. It, it, this concrete surface, I mean, it's more than a surface, this concrete shell becomes almost like a piece of fabric. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Calatrava uh, studied with, uh, with uh, Eduardo Toroja. Uh, and uh, anyway, this engineer, again, in my opinion, was a poet of engineering. And I think any great achievement in, in, uh, in any field actually uh, approaches the, the realm of, of poetry, including science. I think Einstein, the little I know of him and uh, you know, his thoughts, and he was essentially a poet. Now, uh, Instituto de Ciencias, I guess the science of construction, sciences of con construction, a very different kind of work, um, but uh, still uh, intriguing. So since he was acknowledged as, a, as an, an engineer uh, capable of uh, achieving beauty, I think he was given responsibilities to act as an architect. We had a chance here on Zoom many times to have a very interesting guest, an engineer from Los Angeles, a uh, very interesting man who has had and has incredible interest in architecture and also incredible knowledge. I, I was amazed that he, he knew about Jujol, uh, the collaborator of uh, uh, Gaudi, uh, of whom very few architects uh, know actually. And this engineer knows, and he worked with very important architects. I'm talking about Bruce Danziger, who was, and maybe he's here even today. I don't, I only see that there are five people, but I, I know he, he, he sometimes uh, shows up, uh, um, you know, uh, even though he has duties in, in Los Angeles. Uh, he teaches in a college and he works in, um, in an engineering firm, and, but a very interesting man and very knowledgeable again, and very sensitive to aesthetic matters. Um, I think we need such engineers, yes. I would even say we need such architects who have the same passion and the same interest and cultural curiosity as Bruce Danzinger has.
I mean, you see the uh, here at the bottom on the right corner, Arte and Madrid. It's about art, but it's about the work of an engineer. Now, this is another work uh, built by him. And you see uh, it's uh, 32 meters altogether, uh, almost 33 meters without any intermediate uh, support. And it's, uh, it's, again, very elegant and striking uh, uh, as, a, as an engineer, engineering work, but also aesthetically. And not just a project, of course, but a built work. Eduardo Toroja, thin shell, concrete shell, in which he became a great master. And here he wasn't just, uh, you know, the one who drew the shape, the form, but also the one who calculated, who made the, you know, the, the engineer's work, because that's what he was. So, you know, if, if uh, an architect draws this form and then gives it to the engineer to calculate, it's one thing. But in this case, he, he did both. Uh, and uh, I think he, sh he should be doubly admired. It's quite a large space. So there could be beauty in the structure. When the structure arrives at the nobility of a good form, um, you have the best of both worlds. You have structure and ornament. Here, the ornament itself is the building itself. It's not something applied to the walls or the structure in itself, because it, is, uh, it has aesthetical uh, qualities. It becomes ornamental in the good sense of the word. I mean, you know, you look at the plan and then you look at the, uh, the section and you look at the built work and you realize there is a complexity here, which is difficult to foresee just contemplating the plan. Look how thin it is, it's like a line, really. I mean, uh, you know, like a pencil line or whatever on, 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 on paper, it's extremely thin. Eight centimeters, eight centimeters, at, at, uh, you know, 30 meters wide from here to here, there are almost 30 meters and it's eight centimeters thick. It's almost magical. And it didn't even has openings. It's not that, you know, it, it, it would have been still amazing if it was completely, you know, solid, but for a good portion of it, it even, it's broken by these openings. So it's, it's indeed pushing the limits. It's, it's about a fight with the limits and winning that fight, so to speak. Now a market hall from 1934, uh, also Eduardo Toroja, Yes, maybe underneath could be even misery or disorder or the chaos of human activities, but the purity of the roof, the elegance transcends that uh, disorder, you know, maybe it's not misery, but maybe disorder or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, but still the, the, the roof is, is, uh, is, uh, is kind of, uh, you know, uh, balancing everything else is, is keeping everything under control, so to speak, but in an elegant and graceful way. 
I'm not sure about this. I mean, it was 1934. Um, who knows? Maybe he didn't work alone, but the engineer's work is the one that has elegance. It's a market. Maybe this one is a little bit less surprising because it's a symmetrical uh, building and uh, somehow static and central. Okay, so that's all for the moment about Eduardo Toroja. Uh, and now we'll go to a French architect, very different from Toroja, and that is André Lursa. Okay, so um, I begin, I usually begin with the name, but in this case, for some reason, <laughs> I begin with this image from a building, uh, with a building he designed for Vienna, for the Werkbund uh, Siedlung in 1932. Uh, it is a colony of, uh, of uh, houses built by important architects of the time, uh, kind of similar to what happened in uh, Stuttgart where there is a colony uh, uh, also uh, similar, uh, Weissenhof uh, colony of uh, buildings built by famous architects. In Vienna is not so ample, uh, there are smaller buildings, but the one by Lursa is one of the, the largest. And uh, this is what he did. And uh, on the side, of, the side of the building, it's written the name of what is happening here. Werk von Siedlung in Vienna, 1932. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about this uh, rather uh, not unique, but well, maybe unique in a way too, and uh, even strange in a way. André Lursa, why do I say maybe a little strange? Because he had social concerns and he was, uh, I believe he was a communist, and he sympathized uh, with, um, with, with Soviet Union. He worked in Soviet Union for three or four years. And um, that's why about him, I found a lot of information on misfit architects. Uh, and he's one of the misfits. And uh, all the material that I prepared here is, um, is, uh, is borrowed from uh, an article published on misfit architects. So uh, he was a French modernist architect, landscape architect, furniture designer, city planner, and founding member of SIAM, Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne. He was active in the rebuilding in French cities after World War II. Uh, so as you can see, he was born on August 27th, just like Eduardo Toroja, and died in 1970. Lursa was born in uh, this city, which I unfortunately I cannot read because it's this thing on top. Bruyere uh, studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Nancy, worked in the office of Robert Malle Stevens, Stevens uh, a, a very good architect himself, began building a series of houses in the 1920s and became interested in the principles of social housing to address the French housing crisis between the wars. In 1922, he was a founding member of the Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, uh, International Congress of Modern Architecture, along with Adolf Loos, Richard Neutra, Margarete Schütte, Ligotsky, and others. He demonstrated a family residence at the Vienna Verbund exhibition of 1932. Well, among those others, there was also um, Gary Riedveld and Hass Hartung, uh, very important architects in this, uh, uh, you know, Vienna Werkbund exhibition that we saw already a picture of. Produced his best known villa, Heferlin at Ville d'Avray, then went to Moscow to work for the Soviet government from 1934 to 1937. Um, and this is a reason why some people think that he 
fell in a certain obscurity because of his uh, work in Soviet Union. Liu Sai is known for advancing the cause of modernism in landscape architecture. He took a position contrary to the proponents of existence minimum that all social housing must include gardens. In this, I think he was revolutionary because I, I think today we need badly gardens, parks, trees, grass, bushes, you name it. We need oxygen, but we also need the, the we need nature as much as we can. So this man, you know, almost 100 years ago, he had the, the intuition that even social housing and how many people cared about gardens when it came to social housing. And this man thought of it uh, almost 100 years ago. Bravo to him. He's also known for his planned post-war reconstruction of the French city of Maubeuge 19, in 1945. He was a professor at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratifs and the Ecole Nationale Supérieure, Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris from 1945 to 1947, and the member of the Board of Architecture of the Ministry of Reconstruction and Urban Development. But let's notice in this short uh, biographical note, you know, uh, nothing is said between 1947 and 1970, that is 23 more years. So something happened. Anyway, <clears throat> so I took uh, the information about him from architect, architecture or architecture misfit, architecture misfit number 23, Andre Lursa. This is a very interesting website, architecture misfit. Uh, you can find a lot of interesting architects there, the misfits, those who are kind of uh, mavericks, you know, uh, uh, not quite part of the system, so to speak, of the establishment, but very creative and very potentially at least very, very uh, uh, fruitful for those who love the art of architecture. This was the man, André Lursa, French. Uh, and uh, so André Lursa was born three years after Charles Edouard Jean Regri, you know, uh, the one I'm talking about, and died five years after Le Corbusier's final swim. The text that I'm reading from is from architect, uh, architect, architect uh, Misfit, and it, it, it has a personal uh, uh, flavor, so to speak, the language. Uh, Lursa was not only a French, so again, it's important to know that he was uh, three years younger than, uh, than Le Corbusier and, uh, and lived five years after Le Corbusier died. Lursa was not only a French modernist architect active over the same period, but also a landscape architect, furniture designer, urban planner, and founding member of Siam. He, his and Le Corbusier's careers were mostly parallel until the late 1920s when they diverged as much as it is possible for the careers of two architects to diverge. Lursa was born in Bruyere, studied at the Ecole, uh, this I already read. Uh, in the 20s, Lursa was un, in the loop and counted amongst the movers and the shakers. In other words, he was very significant uh, in, uh, for that time in architecture. His architectural ideas were very much a product of that time, and that means they were generally pretty good. Here is his, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of Maison pour, pour uh, Monsieur Bonsel in Versailles. Uh, uh, this is uh, Lursa's 1926 Casa Guggenbull in Paris. Uh, so this was built two years before Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier, if we had to compare the two. And I think this building it shows his skill and uh, it's, it, it's a building that is uh, far from being so famous as the building of, uh, of, uh, of Le Corbusier, but we, we cannot deny its, uh, its uh, you know, visual interest and uh, spatial interest, I imagine. In 1926, 1927, he designed this uh, house in Boulogne. Now, uh, sorry for the resolution of the pictures. 
it's it's not so easy to find uh, good resolution pictures with works by Andre Lursa. Yet I think it's important to know of him. And the Parisian double house with the two names of Maison Double de Franc Townshend and Villa Sera on Villa Sera after the painter. Um, this this language is problematic. Uh, I don't think is uh, the English is very good, but we are going to see other pictures with it's a street for eight eight houses for artists sera was a great uh, um, uh a great uh, artist and even the brother of andre uh, lursa jean lursa had a studio and probably a house on this street adrian his blog tells us lursa was responsible for number three and number four villa sera which were his own home as well as five, eight, nine, and eleven. Well, I, I, I understood he designed eight buildings. Uh, let's take a walk. It's quite the enclave. Sorry about this text. It's a little bit it, on the blog uh, or on the website. It made more sense than here. Uh, nevertheless, this street we are going to see again at the very end of the presentation. It's not going to be a very long presentation. But still, it's an introduction to the work of, a, of an architect who is less known, a modernist who was uh, in good measure a contemporary of Le Corbusier. Um, an interesting idea to have a, a, a street, uh, you know, almost like a private street, uh, not a majestic or very long street, but it has uh, buildings for artists houses and with studios you are going to see also a church designed by this uh, by this architect um, anyway the, the idea to have a cluster of buildings destined to, uh, to artists i think is a, is, is a progressive one and a good one of course he didn't build for himself he had a client but the architecture is his of the same period was Lursas housing in Villeneuve Saint George, George. This was featured in the Russian constructivist journal essay issue number six in 1927. The plans show a concern for housing many people with dignity and without wasted resources. It's a, a block of flats. Uh, and um, through it, he became known to the Russian, to the Soviet public. In 1926, Andre Lursa was one of the three architects Charles de, 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 de Guy asked for a proposal to remodel his apartment on Champs-Élysées. Uh, sorry about the resolution, it's not great. Maybe I can improve on this, uh, on this uh, presentation. But this is a good uh, 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 review of, of his works on his birthday. Lursa's 1929 hotel North Sud in Calvi in Corsica is relatively well known as it was included in Johnson and Hitchcock's 1932 book, The International Style, which as we know was a hit and miss affair. The hotel is very much the artificial object juxtaposed with nature, which depending on what you want to believe is either some contrived modernist aesthetic or precisely what to expect when you build an artificial object on a piece of rugged, uh, rugged uh, landscape. This is his building, and uh, it's not. It has something similar uh, to an extent with a building built in Vienna. Note how the dining room offers a different experience by not facing the water. The library has little daylighting or views, presumably for the same reason. Anyway, these are the plans of the building. Um, it's a yeah. I think he was very good at at, at, at addressing uh, the social housing uh, uh, problem with uh, with the dignity and with elegance, with rhythm as well. Uh, his his buildings uh, have uh, this rhythm, which is not a, a sterile a serialism. Not surrealism, but serialism. S e r e and so on.
But here we see an architect who is not just a social worker, but an architect concerned with aesthetics. A proposal from 1930 uh, for a vertical city, six years after Le Corbusier's La Ville Radieuse, but the solar orientation makes it very much in line with the theme of the 1930 Siam conference, which was a rational lot development in terms of sunlight penetration and health. Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a utopian uh, project. The next project is the Karl Marx Middle School in Ville from 1931 to 1933. Not enclosing the ground level is normally an expensive way to shelter an entrance, but with school buildings, the additional covered outdoor space at ground level makes sense since open area isn't sacrificed to create shelter area. Uh, sorry again for the, the for the resolution and the size of the pictures, but you can still see something. Well, here <laughs> you can and you can't. I mean, it's it's a little bit difficult to read, but anyway, it's a school with a long corridor. quite modernistic. I mean, you look at this building here and you look at the building that uh, uh, Lursa built uh, is definitely on the modern size, the side of, of architecture. The building is still there, still a middle school. These are more recent pictures of the same building. Andre Lursa, along with Adolf Ross, I, I said, uh, I read this already, uh, he worked for the Vienna Werkmund and we are going to see a few more pictures. This is a typical uh, apartment with a, with a staircase is expressed, uh, you know, sculpturally towards the outside. So this is actually the, it has two floors, it's a duplex. And this is the building. We saw the other side here, and we are going to see it again uh, for entrances. A modernistic building, uh, almost uh, you know, by the book, so to speak. Uh, but but uh, especially on this side, I think uh, uh, aesthetically pleasant. Anyone who goes to Vienna, I would encourage to visit uh, Werkbund because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, useful to see in the same place buildings by some very important architects. Neutra, Loos, uh, Hans Hartung, uh, Gary Friedfeld, and others. So this was built by André Lursa. Uh, Maison Hefferlin in Ville d'Avray, 1931-1932, apparently a good, uh, uh, famous work by him, produced his best known villa. This one is Ville d'Avray. This looks rather lovely and a nice residential solution to a narrow plot and a very elegant French take on rationalism. Um, well, this is orthodox modernity, but what is maybe worth mentioning is again his interest in the gardens, and you see even here that uh, uh, that concern for the, for for the green uh, shows up. I mean, the building it is as it is, but he didn't neglect the trees, was always on the edge of greater recognition. His buildings aimed higher than most and some are other good solutions to the problems he set out to solve. What happened? Why we don't know more about André Lursa? 
because he went to Moscow to work for the Soviet government from 1934 to 1937, he was, uh, you know, uh, blamed afterwards, uh, I imagine, for uh, sympathizing with the communists. Here he is. And uh, this is, uh, I think, Gensburg. I, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the Russian, the Soviet uh, architect. All these people are uh, Soviet architects, you know, happy to have the Frenchmen together with them. And uh, there was still, even if it was Stalin, and even if it was, uh, you know, uh, difficult period, ideologically and uh, artistically in the country, there was still a belief in the new man. Uh, even Frank Lloyd Wright gave a talk uh, in, in Moscow, and Le Corbusier also sympathized to them. Many, even Picasso, Picasso had a big exhibition in Moscow. And so there were uh, important intellectuals and artists and architects who sympathized with this idea to create a new man, a new society, not based on profit making, but on different values. Unfortunately, as we know, uh, communism uh, succumbed to uh, all kinds of problems, uh, and it was not realized as uh, its theoreticians hoped. We should have guessed from the planner. Now we look at it, Chloe, it's not unlike a communal house in that it lacks. Um, so he built something there which has a, a communal dining room and bathrooms. The memory and reputation of Andre Lursa then went much the same way as Hans Meyer did in 1933. Hans Meyer was the second director of the Bauhaus School uh, in Dessau before, uh, before, after Walter Gropius and before Miss van der Rohe. He also sympathized with, uh, with the Soviet Union and he also fell in, uh, you know, in. Uh, he was, uh, if not forgotten, but uh, you know, uh, neglected, just like Lursa. So Lursa left the Soviet Union in 1937, the same year Frank Lloyd Wright addressed the first Soviet Council of Architects at the height of Stalin's great terror. Lursa is known for advancing the cause of modernism in landscape architecture. He took a position contrary to the proponents of existence minimum, uh, that all social housing must include gardens. I already read this in retrospect, we can see this interest in uh, 1925 Maison pour, pour uh, M. Bonsal. The garden is carefully laid out as if it wanted to be a vegetable garden. And here is the design of the garden. How many architects design gardens? Well, not too many, but I think we should we should, particularly in the present, we should pay a lot of attention to gardens and maybe we should start designing a house by first designing the garden and then the house and not vice versa. Usually the garden is, if it is done at, at all, it comes after the house. But what if we design first the garden and then we make the house to match the garden? And you see, this is a creative garden. It has elements of abstraction. It's, it's, it's creative. It's an artwork. And, uh, and uh, I think there is a, a great need for something like this, to design more with green, with, uh, with um, organic matter, that is, with what nature gives us. He's also known for his planned post-war reconstruction of the French city of Maubeuge, he was, uh, this I already read, uh, I hope I have some images from this city, which he contributed to after the Second World War, when he returned, well, he returned in 1937, I think, from, from Soviet Union, but uh, then the war was, and uh, after the Second World War, he had a very active role in, uh, in uh, planning uh, post-war reconstruction I think not just in the city of Maubeuge, but in other parts of, the, of France as well. There is an unsurprising gap between 1937, when Lursa returned from the Soviet Union, and the 1947 master plan. So eight years. 
L'URSA did not work, did no work for the 1940-1944 Vichy government, as opposed to Le Corbusier. L'URSA's appointment, and by the way of Le Corbusier, interesting to mention that although he was a forward-looking man, he was uh, not, uh, uh, you know, uh, opposing the, the Vichy government as opposed to his uh, cousin, uh, Jean Ray, Pierre Jean Ray, and, and that's why they had, uh, uh, you know, they, they broke uh, off. They, 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 uh, the two cousins, Le Corbusier and, and his uh, partner, even in his business for a number of years, Pierre Jean Ray refused to collaborate with the Vichy government, but not Le Corbusier. This is something that is painful to, to acknowledge, but we should say it. Le Corbusier, with all his greatness, he uh, was uh, rather uncritical of the government that was uh, collaborative with the Nazis, with the fascism, and with Hitler. Lursa's appointment to the Ministry of Reconstruction and Urban Development shows a desire to be of use. Indeed, and he was of use. Uh, of use. Uh, it was a difficult period because uh, you know, he, he was an artist. I mean, he was an architect with the aesthetical interest, but the, the country needed a lot of uh, reconstruction where the aesthetical matters were not really the most important. So there are many other photos of the reconstructed Maubeuge on the town's tourism website. It's the type of low rise, high density housing Europe needed. So he built a lot of uh, blocks of flats, apartment buildings that were much needed after the Second World War. And, you know, you would say unexceptional buildings, kind of like this, if you want. Built with, uh, you know, uh, little money and uh, quickly. Andre Lursa after the war. But here and there, like in this case, he indulged in, uh, you know, some aesthetical, um, you know, longings or aspirations. Next known work is a house for himself in 1948 in Seoul, about midway between Paris and Orly. Um, yeah, I would I say a rather modern, uh, more, I mean modern without uh, rather modern, but modest house. Pleasant house, nevertheless. It's adjacent to one he designed for a neighbor, Jules Le Duc. Uh, Lursa never let go of the importance of gardens. Again, this I think is important, and maybe in the future I'll make a presentation just about the gardens of Andre Lursa and gardens in general. Uh, and by the way, of gardens, tomorrow I will talk about uh, the father of uh, North American landscape uh, architecture, uh, the great. Uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed uh, Central Park, Prospect Park, and many other parks in the United States. Uh, he, he died on the 28th of, uh, of uh, August. So on the right is the house Lursa built for um, uh, himself. And this is a house he built for that um, other person, Jules something, I forgot his name. After the war. Uh, the, the person who wrote this text, uh, he said, I'm reminded of Cesare Cataneo's Casa da Fito a Cernobio. It makes me think Lursa, like the, the Italians, found, found no reason to abandon rationalism as a way of building. 
this is another uh, in this this was his aesthetics after the war Uh, this is a church. We are approaching the end of this uh, short presentation about André Lursa. Uh, I like this church. Uh, Saint Pierre, Saint Paul in Maubeuge is the city where he contributed with many uh, designs for uh, apartment buildings. And this church, um, I, I regret I don't have uh, uh, I don't have too many pictures. I have anyway. I have a few. Uh, I like this church. You know, it's it's uh, it's uh, it has character. It, it has modernism. It is uh, not uh, uh, you know outrageous as some churches are. It's, it has a sense of modesty, but also this vertical is uh, shows uh, you know aspiration towards the height, towards the beyond. And uh, all in all, I think it's it's a good building. The interior is rather. Plain, you know, but maybe because of the grayness of the walls, maybe something could have been done. Maybe they didn't have enough means uh, in order to do uh, something. But the exterior of the building, I think, is uh, is, is convincing. Lursa. Uh, I imagine he did this artwork, I mean, this uh, done with ceramics, 1958. So uh, the man who had uh, social concerns and was almost a social worker also was capable of expressing himself artistically in a rather, you know, uh, pleasant and engaging way. So I guess the message here is even when we have ethical concerns, we should not forget we are architects. We should not forget that we work for beauty. We should not forget that there is somewhere hidden or less hidden an artist in us. And Lursa, it seems, didn't forget the, the artist within himself. All these things are done by him. And actually, I think they are very interesting. You know, it's a figurative art. Uh, but um, yes, I, I, I think they are interesting. As opposed to Le Corbusier, who used uh, good measure, abstract kind of art, here there is uh, uh, more narration, it's more uh, figurative, and uh, in a way more discreet. And here was the man, here is the man, here was the man, uh, André Lursa. And here he is again, smoking. An interesting man, maybe a lonely man. So uh, I, I'll end with the showing again a few images with that street with the houses for artists, where he built eight houses for artists, uh, the double house for the writer Frank uh, Townshend, the maison, the house uh, Cuyer, and, and, the fra and the house for his brother, Jean Lursa, uh, and uh, then uh, Villa Bomsel, and then one for a lawyer, Edmond Bomsel uh, in Versailles, but this is not in Versailles, I don't know what, uh, maybe the firm of the lawyer was there, and another one, uh, the language here, I, I imagine this text was actually translated into English from another language is, uh, is uh, making me a little bit uncomfortable. Anyway, I'll, sh I'll end the presentation on uh, André Lursa with a few more pictures of that street where he designed eight buildings. Uh, and um, that's how they are in the present. It must be very pleasant, of course, to, to live in one of these houses in Paris.
Thank you. And uh, happy birthday, Andre, Andre Lursa.